Our show is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phone, Kindle Fire, and other devices with Stitcher. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or on Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Pray with me, if you will. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come with the fire and burn. Come with the rain and cleanse. Come with the wind and breathe. Come with the light and reveal. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us. Claim and call us with your care and concern, O God, until we do something. Beloved, this is one of those... uh, that some scholars dispute, meaning they they are not entirely certain that uh, Paul wrote it, but it's certainly influenced. I'm going to side with the the people who say that it's authentic uh, Pauline work. Dr. Carlos Wilton wrote a commentary on this text titled uh, Church with Integrity. In the writing, he says uh, that the, the restaurant Chipotle grill uh, pulled its pork off the menu uh, after uh, of about a third of the restaurants after uh, word uh, was found that they uh, the supplier of the pork had violated animal welfare standards Uh, chipotle promises um, that it serves food with integrity that's a quote uh, and This means to them that if a supplier doesn't treat its pigs according to Chipotle's ethical standards, then the restaurant will not use its pork. A spokesman for Chipotle said that the decision was rooted in our unwillingness to compromise our standards where animal welfare is concerned. In the highly competitive fast food business, you have to respect somebody Uh, who will not compromise its standards just to make a buck. Pulling pork from the menu is going to cost Chipotle a ton of money, yet the company has grown because customers really do prefer, prefer food with integrity. Integrity is not about what we say, and it's true for Chipotle, and it's true for the church. As Paul writes, there is one body and one spirit, He says to the Christians at Ephesus, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God of all, who is above all, and through and in all. Notice that the word one is repeated seven times in three verses. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. At the heart of integrity is oneness. It means that you are whole, complete, and undivided with one set of values. Now, with regard to Chipotle, I can tell you that I've I've eaten at the restaurant once, and I do not hold stock in the company. So just that disclaimer. Uh, A church with integrity is not going to show love in one situation and hatred in another, just as a restaurant with integrity is not going to demand animal welfare in some business dealings and ignore it in others. People really do prefer to worship and eat in places that have integrity. Of course, churchgoers want good music, preaching, and Bible study as well. The message church with integrity on a sign or a website is not going to cause people to rush through the doors. In fact, it might make folks a little suspicious in much the same way that few are likely to trust a place called Honest Bob's Used Cars. Integrity requires deeds, not words. Steve Ells, the CEO of Chipotle, knows this. He laughs when he's asked about the mission of food with integrity and whether it's the key to attracting customers. He says, I don't think so. I've never seen anybody come into uh, the restaurant saying, oh, I want to eat food with integrity right now. Instead, customers care about taste, value, and convenience. Yet once they enjoy a Chipotle burrito, customers are interested in why the food tastes the way it does. 
Els uh, says, we are actually cooking. If you walk into the refrigerator, you'll see fresh onions and peppers and raw meat that isn't tenderized or treated in any way. Integrity requires actions. In a restaurant, this means cooking with fresh vegetables. The motto, food with integrity, is not enough. The same is true for the church. The Apostle Paul puts forth the church with integrity, uh, puts forth a phrase that says what it looks like. He says that people of mature faith live with humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If we perform these actions and also uh, practice speaking the truth in love, then we will grow up into Christ from whom the whole body joined, is joined and knit together by every ligament, which, is the, which then equips each part for working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up into love. So our work begins with humility and gentleness. These are counter-cultural values in a word that seems to reward aggression and self-promotion. With people constantly bragging about themselves on Facebook or Twitter, there's a story of a pastor from Oregon. Recently, uh, he had recently returned from a, a conference in California and tweeted, drove all night, Arrived at church by 8.40, shaved, put on a suit, taught Sunday school, and preached with clarity and passion. The question becomes, Pastor, where is your humility and gentleness? Following the claim and call of God does not require one to drive all night. Servant leaders are called to offer insights in humility, not to brag about the clarity and passion of their work. In verse 2, Paul speaks of patience, another virtue in short supply these days. The entire fast food industry is grounded by our desire to have hot food delivered to us immediately. There's a cute cute, um, uh, commercial which illustrates this, and I'm sure some of you know what the app is. I'm not going to name the app because they're not paying me or this parish to... uh, advertise that, but it's, it's, a, it's a cute commercial. Um, it features rap music artist Snoop Dogg and comedian Gilbert Godfrey. Snoop looks into the camera and he says, are you hangry? No, the signs. Uncontrollable yelling, the camera pans to Gilbert screaming at a jar of kosher pickles. Why aren't you egg rolls, he says. Snoop gives another sign, hallucinations, back to Gottfried, holding chopsticks, looking through uh, a goldfish bowl, snapping those chopsticks and saying, sushi. Snoop Dogg gives the final sign as pants discomfort. The camera moves to Gilbert and he's tugging at his pants and he says, I hate you pants. The final scene shows Godfrey and Snoop with food all around them, Gilbert in his uh, flashy boxer shorts and with over-the-calf socks. Gilbert says, thanks, Snoop, to which Snoop says a version of, of what I'm going to say. This is the very best food app ever. I know some of you know what he actually says, but I, I can't say that in church yet. Uh, Be it same-day shipping, express car service, or food at the speed of life, we want what we want, and we want it now. Yet the work of God requires time, which equals patience. The last thing Paul brings up is the need for us to bear with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, Whether the issue is women in ministry, the full inclusion of gays in the life of the church, the use of praise music and worship, or how money is meted out in terms of mission and ministry, there are going to be Christians of good faith on both sides of the question. When faced with contentious issues, Paul instructs us not to attack each other not to undermine each other, not to try to gain victory over each other, but instead 
to bear with one another in love. I'm going to share several uh, snapshots illustrating or not illustrating the gift of bearing up one another in love. Jeff's going to open this for me. This is how this works. Jeff showed me a uh, text uh, just before worship, and I said, Jeff, would, would you share that? That fits exactly with what Paul is trying to say in this passage, and he's agreed to do this. I came across this on Facebook a couple of days ago and shared it, so I thought I'd share it with Joey today. It starts off, being an atheist is okay. Being an atheist and shaming religions and spirituality as silly and not real is not okay. Being a Christian is okay. Being homophobic, misogynistic, racist, or otherwise a hateful person in the name of Christianity is not okay. Being a reindeer is okay. Bullying and excluding another reindeer because he has a shiny red nose is not okay. Amen. I love that. Okay, here's another snapshot. 33 years ago, uh, a man from the church of my upbringing, those of you who don't know that, is Garden Grove United Methodist Church in uh, uh, central Orange County, California. Um, uh, the man was the treasurer for the church. He... Um, he questioned the uh, United Methodist Church's accounting principles directly with regard to the Board of Pensions of the United Methodist Church. Um, then, the, then Pastor Do Dr. J. Miles Acker Jr. invited the uh, chair of the Board of Pensions for the United Methodist Church to come and speak to the gathered body. And it was a rather large gathering. Uh, and the man came and uh, the, the man who had raised the question, our treasurer, remained outside. I wouldn't have known this except I was called out to address a child care issue. This was before texting and cell phones, a long time before that. And as I went back to the meeting, I asked the man why he never bothered to come into the meeting. He said he knew what the person was saying, and besides, I was just a dumb preacher. And part of that was probably true. So what could I possibly know? My response, I'm sorry to say, was just as sarcastic. Neither of us bearing up one another in love. Next snapshot. I was serving a church in Riverside 29 years ago. A man um, came up to me after a sermon, apparently too pointed for him. He shakes my hand firmly, meaning he was trying to break a bone, and says, Pastor, if you preach a sermon like that again, I will stop giving. My non-Pauline answer, I'm, my non-Pauline response, I'm embarrassed to say, was, tell me what your pledge is, and I'll write you a personal check for the amount in full. Ouch. I still can't believe I said that. 24 years ago, here, from that pulpit, I said uh, the Brady Bill was before Congress, and I said everybody in America ought to have a gun. And there was a little bit of nervous laughter because the gathered beloved knew that was not my view. I then said nobody in America should be able to get ammunition. A little bit of nervous laughter, and I, I remember this is before Chris Rock ought, offered that beautiful line about bullets ought to cost money because then if you're going to put a cap in someone, you ought to know what it's going to cost and whether they're worth it. Well, there was a gift. I was standing at that door at that time, and the first two people out were Naylor and Alta Jones, household saints, just prince and princess of this congregation. Naylor shook my hand. No, he didn't try to break a bone, but he shook it, looked me in the eye, and he said, you know, I'm a lifelong member of the NRA, and I disagree with what you said. His wife stood next to him, her arm in his, and she said, Pastor, I've been married to him for 55 years, and I never agreed with him on this. What a perfect model 
for bearing up one another in love. They trusted me enough to be fully human and fully Christian right in front of me. About 23 years ago, I, I know he founded it longer than this, but Bill McCartney, uh, the coach of um, the University of Colorado, founded this group, Promise Keepers. He had won a national title with Colorado and had a, uh, a what I would call a spiritual uh, born-again experience. And Charlie Cox and Henson Lakin of this parish um, asked me if I would go to a, a, a meeting of Promise Keepers at the Coliseum, which I, I did. And I, I tell you that I uh, came into uh, the fullness of ministry as an experiential Christian, which means a lot of uh, praise singing and uh, speaking in tongues, not me, but listening to others. And it, it no longer fits for me, but I, I did this because I love the late Henson Lake and, and continue to love Charlie Cox. Well, they sent me to a, an international seminar in Atlanta in, I think it was 1993. And it was an extraordinary experience. There were um, pastors, I confess it made me uncomfortable, most of them were men. So, but they were from, I don't know, 20 some countries. A man, I'm not gonna share his name because it gives dignity to what he did, but a man of this congregation uh, knew something of Bill McCartney, thought he was a charlatan and a fraud. Those were the kindest things uh, said. And this person sent a, a letter to Bishop Roy Sano, then our bishop, presiding bishop, saying that I had mishandled finances in this congregation. Uh, I hadn't, but uh, that's what was said. And I had to answer to the bishop. And what I did was through the grace of God, I just did the uh, Jack Webb thing, gave the bishop the facts. Here's all our financial package. Here's our, our uh, financial chair. Here's our treasurer. Um, you know, and I never heard from Bishop Sano again about that. Beloved, I will tell you this. There have been many things that have happened some of them hurtful. I confess that I've been thrown under the bus more than once, but I'm still moving. Some of them blessed and sweet. Most of them blessed and sweet. I tell you this, we come to worship, and some of us are thinking about lunch or our laundry or what we're going to do the rest of the day. Now, sometimes, maybe we're hangry, Maybe we're distracted or maybe we just don't care. I have a colleague now retired who grew up uh, and into ministry in Kentucky in a small town that actually was the, the hometown of the late Harlan Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. He actually did have a, 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 a Kentucky Fried Chicken um, restaurant before it became a franchise. And my, my colleague said that uh, Harlan Sanders did not have the best chicken. The best chicken in this small town in Kentucky was prepared by the, the wife of the sheriff for those in jail. Just a little bit of trivia. But the thing that he shared that was really powerful, he said there, were, there was a fairly large Methodist church and a fairly large Baptist church, and they were constantly changing the time of worship because there were only two really decent restaurants in town. So they were constantly competing for the seating, the best seats at these restaurants. Uh, I grew up, as I've just told you, in central Orange County, so they, we always had options. If, if there one was too busy, we could just go someplace else. The point of this is, I think we're hungry. But we're hungry, as Paul is saying, for the love of God in Christ. Sometimes that hunger causes us to lose sight 
and we turn our hunger into that hangry thing where we're divisive and lack understanding. There was an obit in today's uh, Sunday LA Times that touched me a, a, just a bit, and I'm, so bear with me. I'm, there's just two brief paragraphs. It was for Joan Archer Aldrin, the wife of a, an American hero, Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon. She said, I had married an engineer, and here he was a hero, she told the Times a few years ago, after her husband's historic Apollo 2 mission with Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins. This was disturbing, she said. I didn't understand, and my immediate re reaction was anger toward Buzz. I didn't realize I should have expected it. And here's what her husband said. The future will recall Joan Archer Aldrin as a soft-spoken wife and mother, raising three well-behaved, individual-minded children and dealing with both our tribulations with a most admired human acceptance. Buzz Aldrin said. If that isn't bearing up somebody in the name of love, I don't know what is. We're almost ready for lunch. Amen. Will those who are to assist with uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion please come forward at this time? You will find the order of worship in on pages 9 and 10 in your worship bullets I am in your hymnal pages 9 and 10 as a prelude I, I uh, remind you that in the United Methodist tradition neither myself nor this congregation are host Christ alone is host and therefore all are welcome to participate in the sacrament of communion in a few minutes, the ushers will direct you to come forward and you may kneel and receive first the bread and then the cup. If kneeling is of any difficulty, uh, please feel free to sit in the front pew. If getting to the front pew is of any difficulty, please alert an usher and we're honored to serve you where you are. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift you up. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered it, us from slavery and sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When Jesus was, when, when, when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this often in remembrance of me. Likewise, when supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, 
drink from this, all of you. This represents my love. My, my love in a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and love of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed through his love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, God Almighty, now and forever. Thank you for listening to the First United Methodist Church podcast, which is recorded live every week at 4832 Tahunga Avenue in North Hollywood, California, and delivered by Dr. Joey McDonald. For more info on us, please check out NoHoFUMC.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter under NoHoFUMC.